The deed is done. The quest has been completed. I have finally, after many, many moons, watched every single episode within Side Core 1 of Thousand Year Blood War arc. So I am now ready for Core 2 when it drops in a couple months, July, I believe. And oh my gosh, <laughs> I really should not have done the same thing that I did last time when I made a Thousand Year Blood War arc video. Because if you don't know, the last video that I made on this anime, I watched episode 4 to episode 7, and then I made a video and I was like, man, I really shouldn't have done that because there was so much content within inside those episodes, I should have spaced it out. Well, for this video, I watched episode 8 to episode 13, and there was a whole lot more content in between those episodes than there were in between four to seven. My goodness, okay? It's a lot, brother, all right? So for the sake of this video not being an hour and a half, I'm not going to go into hyper detail on every single thing that happened with inside these episodes. I'm mainly just going to touch on the big stuff and I might just, you know, like sneak in a little thing here and there that was like uh, a small detail that I really did enjoy. But okay. I believe the first place that we kind of need to start out at is Captain Unohana versus Kempachi. Brother, what? <laughs> this fight left me with a lot of questions, but it also answered a ton of questions for me. Like the first question that I had after watching that fight was why wasn't Unohana allowed to fight when the Huandaheik were invading the Soul Society? If she is that powerful, if there's literally no one else with inside the Serete or the Soul Society that could beat her aside from Kempachi, then why wasn't she allowed to fight up against any of these dudes? Maybe, even though she is that powerful, it wouldn't have made a difference in the end, especially since they can steal Bankai, and if she is that powerful, and she has that powerful of a Bankai, and that Bankai scene, by the way, majestic. You can really tell which fights that they truly cared about and truly knew that they had to put their best for, uh, foot forward with, and this is one of those fights. From start to finish, beauty is all you gonna see when you gaze upon this fight scene. And yeah, I'm talking about how powerful Unohana is, but Kempachi, dog, I did not realize he was that friggin' strong. I had no idea Kubo made him that OP. Like, Kempachi has always been overpowered. He's always been that guy, and we love him for it. But the fact that this dude as a kid, was stronger than Prime Unohana and this entire time, just so that he doesn't lose the joy of a fight, he's been subconsciously suppressing his own power so that he can enjoy the battle is insane. And speaking of insanity, in order to get him past this like mental block that he had, or a sin is what they called it, in order to get him past this whole thing, Unohana was literally killing him and bringing him back to life so that he could get closer and closer and closer to just breaking through that mental barrier. It was insane. And let me talk about the Bankai again real quick, bro. Because the, <laughs> the startup of that Bankai and everything that takes place with inside that Bankai scene is absolutely friggin' incredible, dude. The animation is just next level, okay? I love it. And if Core 2 is going to elevate what we've seen in Core 1, my body ain't ready. I'ma explode from the hype. Also, why is Shuhei the new captain, by the way? Can, can I just say that? Like, I get it. It's probably like an experience thing and a relation to uh, Yamamoto, but like, bro, shouldn't it be based off of achievements and stuff? Like, shouldn't, shouldn't before we decide who the new head captain is, like, shouldn't we look at what happened in the battle that literally just happened, you know, where Shuhei wasn't doing anything, he lost an eye, and he got clapped like everyone else? Like, sh shouldn't we... <laughs> Shouldn't we take a couple factors into consideration here? To me, it just kind of seems a bit like a nepotism hire, but that's neither here nor there. Moving on, okay. 
we gotta move on to this whole Ichigo backstory thing, right? Because Ichigo has been trying to get his Zanpakuto fixed, but the way that the, um, the Soul Reapers get their sword and get their Zanpakuto is they get, like, this a little... I can't remember the exact name of it, it starts with an A, but they get this, like, A, it turns into, like, a training sword, and then they train with that sword through years and years and years of fights and all that stuff, and it eventually becomes honed to become their Zanpakuto. The Soul Reapers imprint their soul onto the sword, and that's how it goes. But, you know, Ichigo never went through that. Since the jump, he just started with a sword, so he had to go through the whole process, and no, like a thing chose him so he had to go back to his roots and really figure out where he comes from and what's going on with him and so we get the whole backstory with his dad and his mom and that fight was also very good it was so cool to see prime ishin bro he was so friggin sick and then you have what happened to his mom unfortunately but his mom bodied that white hollow can i just say that but yeah in this backstory we basically learn that ichigo is just like a culmination of every single faction within inside the world of bleach he's a human he's a soul reaper he's a hollow and he's a quincy he's just got all the powers bro <laughs> he's like captain planet with this stuff <laughs> combine all the forces together and you get one of the best MCs in the entirety of the anime genre, and I'ma stick to that statement because it is what it is. It's truth, bro. I gotta speak it. But yeah, not only does he learn what happened to him, but he actually learns what happens to his mom. And I was always curious after learning who Ichigo's mom was. She was a Quincy. I was wondering why wasn't she able to beat Grand Fisher? Well, we get the answer in one of these episodes, I can't remember the exact one, and it's because Yuha Bak, after he had done his old 900 years, 90 years, 9 year thing, he took the powers of the Quincy that he thought were weak and he gave it to himself so he could regain all of his powers. So he took Ichigo's mom's power and that's why she died to Grand Fisher and I thought that was crazy and it was even crazier to learn well maybe not even crazier but it was just as crazy to learn that he did the same thing to Uryu Ishida's mom as well and I'm just kind of like it's wild to me that you're gonna show Uryu Ishida joining Yuha Bak after telling me that he is the reason why Uryu's mom's dead. Like, you think I'm gonna believe for even half of a second that that dude's actually joining Yuha Bak's side? <laughs> like, no, bro. I don't think so. He's literally just there so that he can get closer to this dude so that he can kill him himself because I'm sure he learned that information, if not at the exact same time as Ichigo, close to the exact same time as Ichigo. And after said Ichigo learns who he actually is and what his backstory is and all his stats, <laughs> he then goes back to where he picks one of those A-sword things and he, he grabs the A-sword thing and it turns into the white hollow that has been inside him this entire time. And then when the sword is being forged, we learn about Zangetsu because I, like many people before me, have been wondering what is up with the Zangetsu design? Why does he look like Yuha Bak? Well, we get the answer to that question and the answer is since Ichigo is part Quincy, and since Yuha Bak made the Quincy, his blood is kind of running through Ichigo's veins. His spiritual pressure is with inside Ichigo as well. So, you know, Zangetsu is kind of the manifestation of Yuha Bak with inside Ichigo, and at the same time, he's kind of not. He's still kind of his own thing. But golly, bro, that reveal was crazy. And the emotion in that scene was really felt. You really felt just how much Ichigo cared for Zangetsu, bro. And then Zangetsu passes away and we get the number one theme. The ending of episode 13 was in friggin' sane, bro. The blade is me, let me tell you. You know the scene where he evaporates the entire river, the lake, whatever you call it, I think it was actually an ocean, it was way more incredible. He evaporates the entire ocean My with his goodness. blades being forged. So he's got two swords, one being Zangetsu and one being the White Hollow, but uh, apparently that's not even actually the case anymore. Apparently they're both gone and he said, uh, I won't fight using your powers anymore. I'm gonna fight using me. The blade is me. I'm just curious how that whole thing works. 
and I can't wait to see what happens next, bro. Bleach Core 2 coming in July. Ya boy is friggin' excited beyond belief. But yeah, that's gonna do it for this one. Thank you all very much for watching. I hope that you all enjoyed. If you did, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And I will see you all in the next one. Peace out, everybody.